I really missed NAB this year, not because I wanted a, another week in Las Vegas. I certainly didn't. But there are always a handful of people I talk to there who uh, help build my understanding, who, who really worth talking to. One of those is Eric Otto from Media Proxy. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to talk to you, Eric, now over 17,031 kilometres of the wonderful internet um, at his home uh, near Melbourne in Australia. Hi, Eric. Hey, Dick. Nice to meet you again. It's been a while. <laughs> um, it's a good one. So, uh, yeah. Um, Media Proxy. Just just give us the, the, the two-sentence introduction to Media Proxy. You want the uh, the uh, elevator pitch? Um, yeah, look, we, yeah. We, we've been... We've sort of been in compliance, regulatory compliance recording uh, from from turn of the century. Now, turn of the century, I guess, makes it makes us sound old now, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's been a while. So we we've been we've been doing compliance recording and monitoring for a long time. So um, we've seen we've seen a lot come and go. Um, I, I guess most people know the discipline of what it is, and I guess yeah, most recently it's sort of got got a bit more bit more a uh, bit more of an awareness uh, with everyone but um yeah look we 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 we're, we're doing what we're doing and i guess yeah the engineers that we are we, we we're trying our best to to keep moving that path forward great so so you're a, a relatively small business but a vitally important niche business then yeah look i mean yeah we're not we're not everts yeah let's <laughs> Let's put it this way, uh, or Grass Valley, but um, we we certainly we certainly find there. Uh, look, I always explain it to people, and uh, yeah, like when when you meet friends at barbecues and they say, "What? what so what do you do?" And I said, oh, where, "Where do I start?" Yeah, like it's uh, mm. like, as as we refer to when we speak to civilians. Um, yeah, what do you, what do you actually say? So, uh, I guess broadcast broadcast in itself and broadcast technologies is quite a small industry. I mean, like I always say, if you, if you if you want to make real money, go into into oil mining, um, finance maybe. Um, yeah, but um, it's it's yeah, it's a hobby or a sentence. It depends on how you look at it. So yeah, I've, I've always considered it a hobby more than anything. Um, yeah, look, what's what's been not, certainly not big. I think the discipline of compliance logging in in the grand scheme of our of our of, of the niche market that is broadcast anyway, broadcast technology. We um we we certainly were always the the other end of the the, the bookshelf, so to speak, the book end on on the um, on the receiving side. Um, to yeah, but by, by the time everything is done, we sort of have to now yeah have an opinion on the source and and also make sure that what went to air was actually correct. Like in terms of regulatory compliance, as you know, many countries are, are regulated and the government sort of stipulates and mandates what people have to um, yeah how, how content is needs to be transmitted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So so yeah, so we we certainly not not the not not a big company, but yeah, we we we've been, it, the discipline of compliance has become more than it it ever has been. I mean, we all remember replacing VHS tapes turn of the century, as I said. Like, um, um, yeah, that that's where it all came from, and we were one of the first companies to build a a digital system, like a like a computer based system to to record this. Um, of course, nowadays the kitchen sink is in a product. Yeah, as I always say. By the time you look at it now, twenty years on, um, it's it's quite remarkable the amount of features that are in in a product such as compliance logging. I mean, it's it's the, the discipline has sort of gone well beyond the the regulatory part of it. So, yeah, it's it's certainly become become more important than sometimes customers realise. I said earlier that uh, we regularly meet at NAB, and obviously we didn't this year. Um, it's it's clear from what you're saying that your business is very international. So how are you keeping up with your market? Yeah, good. I, it's a good question. Um, well, I guess the yeah, I, I used to say the word is um, life's like a trade show uh, for anyone in broadcast. There's there's always a trade show somewhere. So it's not a cabaret; it's a trade show. Um, see, nowadays I think I have to change this now. Like life's become a Zoom session, so it's <laughs> it's sort of swung around really. So it's yeah, it's all about how do you connect and and the, I mean the interesting part is apart from seeing everyone's lounge room or study, it's um, mm. yeah the, the I guess a lot of businesses are now finding out that yeah it is possible to do business like it's like anything it's it's yeah the world has thrown us a curveball and and we're going to we're going to now live with it now how are we going to deal with this well yeah humans are pretty resilient so we I'm, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna make this work like we make our business work like broadcasters like the you know, the sun comes up tomorrow and 
and broadcast goes to air and we we adjusted and adapted very quickly i guess being engineers that's what we do we solve problems now the, the thing that's not very good, of course, is the human interaction, of course, the, the personal interaction. But I, I think that's a new world order anyway, So, and which is which is yeah, a different story for another day, I guess, to discuss. Um, uh, yeah, do we miss trade shows? Absolutely, because, well, we, we catch up with yeah nice people like yourself and, and, and everyone else. I mean, it's, uh, as I always say, like, and yeah, there's no offense meant to anyone, but it's... Uh, because it's a family broadcast is an extended family like because as i said it's it's other lifestyle ascent and so we we tend to know each other even at a global um level and and you're catching up at things like or treasures like nab or ibc it's yeah it's it's like christmas yeah where you where you once a year you see everyone that you really like to see and people that you really not like to see at all <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's it's a bit like that so but I think the human interaction will will definitely be be somewhat left um, on the by the wayside now, and I think I think that's that's the thing that I would probably miss most. Um, but I think from a technical point, hey, we're engineers. I mean, we're dealing in video and audio, and and this is exactly what we are currently doing. Um, I, I think because everyone on the other side is currently in the same boat, so we um, yeah we we all adapted pretty quickly to work out that you don't need to be in the office all the time and you you maybe not need to be a trade shows all the time so it'll it, i i don't have the crystal ball it'll be interesting to see how how this pans out and and yeah whether people want to justify the significant cost of a trade show um compared to how they're adjusting to the workflow now so I, I, trade shows will definitely play a role yeah in what capacity and when they're going to become viable um will be interesting so I, I believe it will be a while i mean to give you an idea um international travel i mean the, the ceo of Qantas, you know it's a small airline with a kangaroo on the back um yep. they um he, he spoke yesterday and and i mean as the ceo of an airline you'd like to think you have somewhat of an idea about when international travel is potentially viable again because um their livelihood hangs on it um he, he essentially said yesterday that there won't be any international travel out of australia for at least at least a year Whoa. So that yeah. sort of that sort of puts it into perspective. So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah who am I to say what's going to happen? But I, I guess we, yeah, we have to, yeah, we have to be realistic. That's what I'm saying. So this yeah. is not going to go away. It's going to be there a while. Yeah. It's going to be there a while. I mean, sure. we, we're lucky. We're, we're sort of we're much better off, I guess, um, because yeah, smaller population and yeah, bigger country and yeah, wider distances and everything else. But yeah, in in densely populated countries like you see what happened i mean you look what happened in london or yeah, in parts of yeah. parts of the us and in brazil and yeah, those sort of yeah. places um I, I really feel for those people it's it's terrible it's 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 a, it's a human tragedy so i i yeah I, I can't even imagine to think that that people speak of of a numbers like i, I think that's yeah. to me that's the most disappointing part like it's 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 all about how well do you do in numbers and of course yeah, humans are quite yeah. decoupled very quickly um yeah like it's it's um yeah it's not good, but yeah, we're not here to talk about about more COVID. No. I think it's been discussed <laughs> to great extent. No. no, let's 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 go back to the uh, the broadcast family, and uh, it suffered a bit of a shockwave in your part of the world last year when one of your competitors effectively vanished in a puff of smoke. What happened there? Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it, you just, you just have to live long enough to see it all. As I, as I keep saying, look, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly un, unprecedented because, um, it's like normally what, what you have is if companies, yeah, like clearly a lot of companies are, are they have an exit strategy rather than a roadmap. Let's call it, yeah, let's put it this way. So and that's yeah, that's what it is. It's a business model, and you pursue it, and yeah, you're looking for looking for a buyer eventually, and you get sold. N normally, what happens is you get sold to someone who maybe sees potential in in the IP that you have, sees synergy, um, yeah, sees something in it to to keep keep the torch alight. I guess. Um, I guess. I guess when Verizon bought Volicon, um, yeah, obviously they, they clearly saw saw something in it, and it's probably not part of what we want to discuss today. But um, I, I guess the fact that they dropped them. Ultimately, um, it wasn't a surprise to me because one thing that telcos um, are, are not known for is buying broadcast companies and 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 taking them to new heights. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, there, there was a little bit of putting two and two together. I guess, I guess, because everyone's so busy these days, it sort of got 
got shoved by the wayside and and um i guess when they ultimately got dropped um yeah i, I guess it was it was it was it was a real shock because now now you, you you have this void in the market now all of a sudden it was a product completely disappeared i mean try to imagine you you, you like um you like Voxel, yeah, and uh, it's your car brand. You really like it. You don't mind the cars, and and you'd be quite happily driving more of them. And and um, all of a sudden, they decide General Motors just decides no more. <laughs> so you know you got to look for something else. Um, and yeah, like if if this was sort of your your preferred brand, almost um, as as we all some some somewhat have. Um, now what do you do? So now you 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 actually have to now start looking. So it was it was a real. Is a real shock to um, for people to really um, now be thrown into a situation that they wouldn't would not normally have been in. And I, I must admit, like I'm not quite sure whether you've seen it, but I I have not come across um, uh, any company, at least in broadcast, that have has been dropped um, at that sort of significance and 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 left this massive void in the market now globally to for someone for someone else and to pick up the pieces or for others to pick up the pieces. Um, Picking up the pieces is is must be at least in part, good news for you. But is it unalloyed good news or are you being diverted to try and help the Volicon customers who are now desperate for continued solutions? Yeah, look, see, I I, I think I, I actually feel for Volicon customers. Like I really feel for them because I put myself in their shoes and I think, well, maybe I wouldn't maybe I didn't really want to look for a new product, you know, because I was actually quite happy with that. Cause yeah, I mean, we, we competed with Volicon now since 2006 or something when they entered the market. So, I mean, to us, they were a reasonably new player actually at the time, cause we've already been doing this for six years. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I, I yeah, as I said, like it's, they, they were a, a good competitor and, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in competition because yeah, you, competition grows the market and, you can't do it by yourself, uh, especially when we started off. Um, yeah, compliance wasn't really um, something that that customers saw value in in terms of a digital system because, yeah, like the VHS recorders were rattling away and they were cheap and and everything. So it was it was pretty much an upsell in the early days. So so to have other companies to 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 help you build the market essentially was essential, and and they've certainly done this. And I guess for, for a long long time it was pretty much us and Volicon. So at 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 the serious level, let's put it this way, and and so yeah, so I don't envy customers to um to having to go through the cost, the pain, and the procedures now to to pick a new product. Um, now, of course, on, on the flip side, and of course, it was good for us. I mean, I'd be lying if it wasn't good for us, I guess. But on the other hand, I guess yeah, we, we at that point in time we were already taking customers off them um, because yeah, we. We have a very solid solution. So, and and customers already saw the value before, even before Volicon got dropped. Um, now, but of course, the um, yeah, now now being thrown into into the the cost of it and the process of it, it's it's more a fact that I would I would say to them, and, and yeah, as we're having conversations with all these customers, that we 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 sort of say to them, look, here's your opportunity to take a deep breath, come up for air. And, and actually have a look and see what's around. It's a bit like, I know you've always been buying Voxel, but yeah, there's this other brand that you might want to have a look at. It's been around for a while. And and yeah, it's it, yeah, there, there is, there is something that you can now, you can see this as an opportunity to look at what you're going to invest in for the next essentially five to seven years. Yeah, because most of the technology choices are not made for just a couple of years. Yeah, so it's it's a real opportunity for customers, I guess. That, that's how I see it. Yeah. So is it changing the nature of the conversation between customer and supplier? Are they looking for, uh, well, putting more emphasis maybe on on the roadmap, on on the sustainability of it? Yeah. So look, I, as I said, it's it, because it's an opportunity for them. Like I, I guess the conversations that we're having now is um, with with all of the projects that are obviously currently going. It's it's more a, a case of you've got to. It's your opportunity now to look. To look beyond sort of the buttons, essentially, like um, interminable Zoom sessions will will get you across the yeah core functionalities, the buttons. Like, what what does this thing do? Does it does it tick the boxes? And and I think on paper, like by the time you look at everyone's brochure, everyone ticks the box. Like it's yeah, that well ticks the boxes. Um, yeah, because we, we do have there, there are certain yeah regulatory requirements you've got to fulfill and yeah, you, you call, record video audio loudness captions um, yeah subtitles I guess um, loudness obviously so 
all of those things, of course, yeah, you, you do tick the box. Otherwise, you're not in the game. It's as simple as that. So, so now you look beyond it. As I said before, uh, they are the, the kitchen sink is in the product. So a lot of customers now use the product well beyond the original rec- compliance requirements. I guess because they're trying to yeah see something that was a cost center. They're trying to make money now out of the system. And of course, over the years, with all the features that we added. Um, from yeah, you know, from from study for monitoring, like monitoring analysis, like for study triggers, um, um, yeah, automation system integration, ad analysis, um, um, yeah, audio watermark detection, um, viewer ratings analysis, um, publishing to social media, um, assisting news workflows, and of course now now very topical remote workflows yeah because intrinsically a compliance logger works works um um through through a, a, an html5 web interface and and yeah can essentially take take advantage of of low bandwidth um, um monitoring features so you you can literally have mcr operators and and people quite comfortably working from home which is exactly what's happening so so we in a weird way we're even fitting a very nice niche um, on 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 the remote working or the re- remote workflow side as well, um, so that 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 part yeah w- w- works really well. Uh, that was going to be my next question. That, that we're all talking about remote production at the moment, so yeah, that's inherent because you're dealing through HTML um, as 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 your standard connectivity anyway. Um, does the need for remote working um, inevitably mean the cloud? Or are people keeping technology in house? Yeah, look, um, I, I guess see, to us, it makes actually no difference. Um, like, at least speaking for ourselves, like the, the solution that we build is is intrinsically virtualizable, and 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 with that comes, of course, um, yeah, something that you can comfortably run in 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 the cloud, in the public cloud, I guess, yeah, or, or private cloud, I guess. Now. In in terms of the viability, um, yeah, I, I guess what, what sometimes gets gets forgotten, like there are certain certain disciplines in broadcast that are that are very virtualizable, and and yeah, you almost it's a bit like you wouldn't run a, if you're setting up a new company or or you're migrating your IT forward, like you, you wouldn't really run a, an exchange server on prem anymore, like it you just wouldn't do that. You just buy into into something online and it would be madness to, to, to think about doing this on-prem. So you, you have certain products that just fall in a category that you, you would be mad not to do it. On the other hand, you have you have products that you're now trying to shoehorn into, into a platform. And you'd be amazed that there are, yeah, broadcast is, is, is one of those industries, like not, like just because, yeah, just because you you have a hammer net, not everything is a nail. I guess it's usually what we say. It's um, yeah. it's, you got to you got you got to pick pick your battles here, and you're going to work out what you want to do. Now, I, I think whilst we're very very much virtualizable, and, and we have many customers who run us in the cloud as well, um, there there are cost implications. It's as simple as that. Like um, yeah, unlike a playoff system that, that sources a file, puts it into RAM, plays it out. Um, yeah, like it's sort of. It's it's very it's very viable, I guess. Like compliance logging systems, they usually come at scale. People want to record multiple channels um, because we do all the heavy lifting of having to deal with the source, demux it, decode it, re-encode it, and and essentially then also monitor and provide all of the extra functionality. So we, we're we're not a kind citizen on the cloud now because the the three sort of parts that the cloud is charging you for, which is um, um, CPU. <laughs> Uh, with, um, yeah, um, um, egress and storage, like we, we're we're very high consumers of, like the, the we forgot the trifecta, so to speak, in our product, um, and so so there will be it it's it becomes a number crunching exercise. Now the interesting part, because of the the, the circumstances that we're finding ourselves in through COVID, now it, it's more a case of. I don't think anyone is now thinking any less of the cloud or moving to it. If anything, those things will have to accelerate because people realize that they don't want to have staff in offices anymore or not as much. And they they, they do not want to manage a lot of on, on-site prem kit. Like that's that simply is not going to happen. So anyone who's who's in the decision making sort of position of the pro, of, of the companies, um, they certainly like they will certainly want to move and steer their their business more and more to cloud. So with that, 
yeah, we're well and truly more than ready, and we have been for a long time. So, so it'd be interesting to see what the uptake is. Um, but, um, but, but, but definitely there will be um, there will be an ongoing trend of, of virtualization and, and cloud. And yeah, whilst whilst mo- whilst some broadcasts broadcast products are not a, not a very good fit. Um, after all, we're engineers; we'll make it fit. We always have. So. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. And and does that then impact on service and support? If you're um, selling a virtualizable product, then presumably you have a set of services that fit neatly together in a standard code base, and you you plug in what the guy wants. Yeah. So I mean, look, when we, see when we're talking about, I, I guess maybe what what you're sort of referring to in general, I guess in, in, in our world that sort of lines up nicely with what happened to Volicon, I guess is one thing that I've been talking to customers about is is, is sustainability. So, yeah, no, you, you probably don't hear this. You don't hear this term very often in the context of broadcast technology. But uh, see, see we, we, we sort of look at this more from the point of – your 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 product your software is is essentially the asset that you are that you are selling to customers. Um, yeah, whilst the customers see see the buttons and the and the features first and foremost, and of course um, they are very important. Now you sort of crack crack through all the layers of of of, of importance by the time you, you you've gone past the, the the fancy GUI and and the buttons and you say okay it ticks the boxes, then you sort of you should really start cracking a bit lower. Um, down to to the core of the engine, yeah? um, and of course, the, the car analogy always works. Like it's, yeah, it's it's not all about the cup holders in the airplay. It's uh, you know, it's there is there's still a drivetrain that that makes this thing move forward, and yeah, you don't want to break down at every second intersection. So um, we we then sort of beyond it now. That's and that's a good thing. I mean, there's a lot of due diligence done as well, even at, at that sort of level. I always argue, look, when you're testing a solution, pull the cable out and see how it goes. <laughs> you know, like gets forgotten yeah. Yeah, as I said, yeah. because everyone tends to look at the buttons. Um, so and and so by the time you, you go below the sort of reliability layer, then you sort of look at how how does the company operate in terms of in terms of how how does the, the how does the software development team work, the support team, like like how do they treat. How do they treat this? Are they feeding and watering their product, like, or are, are they just hacking to get a sale? Um, and and you know, there's a lot of that. Look, I mean, if you if you're a startup, fair enough, you, you hack yourself into oblivion because you you want to get sold in six years, and then that that pile of rubbish that is your source code is someone else's problem. <laughs> it's, uh, that's usually how it goes. Yeah, now, now, now if you if you're running a company like ours that have been around for twenty years. Like I'd like to think that I do this until my retirement, yeah. Or, or maybe, maybe I still try to keep going in the nursing home. But let's see how that goes. Like I'll, I might talk to you <laughs> then. Yeah. So, okay. is that the way that um, customers should be should be looking at potential vendors? That, that that there is a sustainability about it. There is a security in the product, and there is a clear forward path. Yeah. So, I, I, look, I, I'm a firm believer in 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 yeah, like the the bit that the bit that should be interesting to customers is is not the bit that they're first and foremost interested in, and and I think it's it's by by practicing like sustainable software development almost um, like that's sort of what we perceive to be sustainable. In other words, is it sustainable to to um, yeah to 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 meet customers' demands and also still have a roadmap? And and be able to provide support, and, and whilst doing all of this, is the is the product crumbling around it? Like, or, or is it yeah. is it actually sustainable to a degree that you can you can still confidently support it? Look, a lot of a lot of things are now workflows, of course, um, and as as customers are sort of um, tooling up as well. I mean, the customers that we we speak to now, they they have their own development departments. Yeah, they they want they want to interact with us at a very at a very low level, like they want APIs, they want they want to work with us on workflows and how they can use um, components and technologies in the engine that we have um, to their advantage without yeah, without pressing buttons. Because of course that's becoming even more more prominent and important in in, in times of remote remote production, so to speak. Like it's you, you want to automate as much as you can. So at, at that point, you're covering a lot of ground now. And and of course, if you if you if you don't practice that sort of sustainability across your your engineering team, 
I guess it's um, it's it's not going to be good. And and of course now now you have the problem with customers being thrown into an environment where they have to pick something. Like they have to pick something. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's really. Do you really want to do you really want to make the same mistake again and look at a company that's potentially yeah has more of an exit strategy rather than a roadmap? Do you have a do you have a company that just looks good on the buttons? Do you do you have a yeah? How, how far do you go in testing? Um, so. So a lot of those questions need to be need to be answered, and for some of them, very quickly. So as I said, as I said before, I don't envy them at the moment. Eric, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Before we go, I um, have made a point of spotting guitars in the background of of our engineering interviewees. I'm reassured to see that you have a keyboard next to you. Yeah, and and I'm not really even a keyboard player. I have to say, like it's it's just because I have a. <laughs> I have a recording studio. I was I started off as when I was when I was a lot smaller. Um, I started off as an audio engineer, so I've, I've still maintained a studio. So my guitars are actually back in the in the cupboard there. So so I do have guitars. So I should have got them out. So my apologies. So I've got my little puppies. Right. So they're they're currently uh, it's bedtime now. It's in Australia, so they're already just about asleep. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's really funny because I've, I've been seeing this in your interview. So a lot of a lot of lot of people in our industry that they, they can't help it but make music. So um, so maybe one day we all get together and and have some sort of concert. I'll bring my double bass. <laughs> and, That's uh, right. Great to talk to you. <laughs> great to talk to you, Eric. Talk to you soon, and I hope in person all right, one day. Big, big. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye bye. Cheers.